for whether to limit the size of ammunition magazines and the number of so-called military-style features, like pistol grips, forward grips, adjustable stocks, and flash suppressors. Gun rights advocates say proposals like these are based on fundamental misunderstandings, starting with what they consider a loaded term, assault weapon. There's nothing assault about it. A person can be the uh, assaulter and, and, and turn it into an assault weapon, but this gun is used for self-defense. Rick Friedman runs the RTSP gun shop and range in northern New Jersey. He doesn't just sell AR-15s, he owns them, four of them. Friedman, who didn't grow up around guns, says proposals to restrict rifles like the AR-15 are based in part on the fact that they look scary rather than what they actually do. To prove the point, he showed us a more powerful rifle, the 30 caliber M1. This firearm here would not be banned uh, under any proposed legislation because it does not have a pistol grip. So they're looking obviously for different characteristics that make it military or assault where this gun would become illegal, uh, yet it's less powerful. Really simple. When you pick up the gun, we keep our fingers straight. Point it at ours. Owning an AR-15 depends in large part on state laws, which are all over the map. The sale of new ARs is either banned or strongly limited in five states and the District of Columbia. In seven states, sales are legal, but subject to an assortment of background checks, age restrictions, and local regulations. The remaining 38 states, from Washington to Florida, have almost no restrictions. Just walk into a Walmart or other retailer or gun store, pass an instant background check, and walk out with a brand new AR-15. Exactly what I want. All right, you can take it. I'm ready to take it with me. All right, perfect. And it gets easier. Private sales, like many made it gun shows, often require no background check. A Senate bill backed by President Obama to close that loophole was defeated. So all in all, this was a pretty shameful day for Washington. But this effort is not over. There are already some 4 million AR-15s in civilian hands. Most of those owners are law-abiding. Some of them are dentists. Tens of millions of us are responsible gun owners, and to punish us for the deeds of a few deranged people, uh, whether they use an AR-15 or, or a car, uh, you know, um, I, I don't think that's right. So. That view strikes at the heart of a fundamental debate, pitting the right to own powerful weapons against this. It's an assault rifle. We need rescue inside the auditorium. Multiple victims. A paramedic lifted on my shirt and said, if I work on her, she's going to die. We need to get her out now. Coming up, a survivor's story. Those are the kinds of wounds that our folks over in Afghanistan are seeing. And here I am sitting in Aurora, Colorado, seeing these kinds of things. The toll of the AR-15 when we return. Looking at 23-year-old Farah Sudani, you wouldn't know it's astounding she's even alive or that on one terrifying night, she came about as close to dying as any human being can when a man armed with an AR-15 went on a rampage. I remember hearing pop, 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 like that fast. So I looked up, saw some people walking, some people running to the exits, and I thought it was a prank. Somebody is still shooting inside theater number nine for an employee. And all of a sudden, I feel my side is warm. I got people running out of the theater. They're shot. <laughs> and I put my hand on it, and I could just feel blood dripping down. Christine, I got seven down in the theater night. Seven down. I took a step to grab my friend Mike, and my organs came out. So my intestines and my stomach, to be exact, and what was left of my spleen. Cruiser 10, I need a medical crew at night. I've got one victim eviscerated. On July 20th, 2012, in an Aurora, Colorado movie theater, Farah Sudani became part of a select group, people who'd been wounded in a mass shooting and survived. The accused gunman, James Holmes, had several firearms, including a shotgun, 
a pistol, and the same type of weapon later used in the Newtown Massacre, an AR-15 rifle. It's an assault rifle. We have, we have a magazine down inside, so everybody go watch out for the assault rifle. You said that you got down on the floor. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? Why did you know to do that? I was really hurt, and my first instinct was I need to lower my blood pressure. So I just laid down, and I tried to stay as calm as I could. So what did you see, what did you hear when you were down on the ground? Screaming of every kind, people screaming from getting hit. You can tell when they were wounded, because it's not just screaming, it's an instant burst of their voice. I've seen a lot of gunshot wounds in my life, but these were absolutely completely different than anything else I've ever seen. Camilla Sasson was one of two emergency physicians on duty at the University of Colorado Hospital. Not only was it just the sheer number of people that were kind of coming into the emergency department who had so many horrible injuries, um, but some of the injuries that they had I had never really seen before. According to court documents, 65 of the 76 shell casings recovered from the scene were from the AR-15. That squares with the carnage Dr. Sasson saw rolling into the emergency department that night. I can't say for sure if they came from one gun or the other, but what I can say is that the types of injuries and the amount of destruction that we were seeing in people's bodies is something that you can't do with a shotgun or even with, um, with a handgun. But is the AR-15 more dangerous than any other weapon? According to the FBI, of the 8,500 firearm-related homicides in the U.S. in 2011, 323, fewer than 4%, were committed with rifles, and only a portion of those were AR-15s. In fact, more Americans are killed each year by blunt objects than by semi-automatic rifles. Yet when they are used in a crime, the same qualities that make ARs appealing to owners their power, ease of use, and a rapid rate of fire can make them shockingly effective. The projectile fired from an AR-15 type of, of rifle is a very specially designed projectile. Donald Jenkins is a surgeon at the Mayo Clinic and a ballistics expert. When a high velocity projectile such as that fired from an AR-15 enters the human tissues, it is designed to tumble and then break apart. And it breaks apart into multiple fragments. If it strikes bone or if it strikes an organ like your liver, uh, that is devastating. Jenkins says the injuries inflicted by the AR-15 small caliber high velocity bullet are similar to those he saw on the battlefield as a military trauma surgeon in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is an example of the upper arm humerus bone that's been destroyed by a high velocity round that is a projectile coming from an AR-15 type of rifle. That bone is devastated. Those tissues are devastated. You cannot put this back together. This is likely going to result in amputation. When the smoke from the Aurora shooting cleared, Farah Sudani was among the survivors. That's what's up. A 24-year-old aspiring sportscaster named Jessica Gowie was not. My daughter was hit six times with an AR-15. Sandy Phillips is Jessica's mother. She was hit in the left shoulder and received 15 pieces of shrapnel. and was hit in the left forehead, which was the kill shot. Phillips, a gun owner herself, has channeled her grief into action, calling for an outright ban on the weapon she says was used to kill her daughter. This should have and could have been fixed a long, long time ago. Let's keep it limited. Let's not make weapons that can take 26 people out in, in one school in just seconds that can take 12 people's life and 58 other people wounded in 90 seconds. Do you think the outcome of that night would have been different had the gunman not had access to an AR-15? Absolutely. How so? I think that he would have had maybe had more handguns. Hopefully less people could have gotten hurt. Um, Farah Sudani has made a remarkable recovery, though she will always bear the scars. And we were there when she reunited with some of the people who saved her, including EMT Daryl Johnson and Dr. Camilla Sassy. Are you serious? 
Oh my god. <laughs> oh, are you? Oh wow. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> It's okay. If you want a window into the complexity of the gun debate, consider this. Farah Sudani isn't convinced the AR-15 should be banned. There's like no reason you should be alive right now, yeah. honestly. If that doesn't make sense to you, Fight! it does to them. Coming up, training day in Tennessee for AR-15 owners. I'm talking about millionaires, I'm talking about plumbers, I'm talking about doctors that are coming to these classes that are afraid. Prepping for battle when we return. The back roads of western Tennessee are secluded, peaceful. But follow Route 70 outside the town of Camden, and the sounds grow louder as you arrive at the beating heart of America's gun culture. Here, the air is thick with the smell of gunpowder. Cover! They're basically learning the mindset, tactics, and skill they need to protect themselves in a violent confrontation. The instructor is a 42-year-old former cop named James Yeager, a married father of two. Come on, guys, come on down here. These men have come from around the country to train with him. Every one of them has brought an AR-15. ARs are what's used in video games, or what's used in movies, they're what's used in actual conflicts. It's kind of like America's rifle. Some of these men bought their AR-15s for hunting. I am Justin Hyden. My occupation, I'm an electrical engineer. Like Others for home defense. They come from different places and different backgrounds. My name is Lane. I'm an accountant. My name is uh, Danny Valenzuela. I'm an electrician. I've got zero training. They are all gun guys. But among Second Amendment absolutists, few are more absolute than James Yeager. Uh, as you guys have probably figured out, I had kind of an attitude problem. Even his arms are armed. I do believe that a citizen, according to the Constitution and the writings of our founding fathers, should have the same kind of stuff that an infantry soldier would have, and that includes an AR-15. Is it your choice as a self-defense weapon? It, there's one beside my bed. Why? to protect my home and my family. How many magazines will they shoot? They'll shoot 1,500 rounds. Yeager says his beliefs are deeply rooted in the Constitution, no, no, but there's more. For these weekend warriors, the AR's military pedigree is part of its allure. Shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. I'll tell you, as a former cop, as a former security contractor, I like getting geared up and taking classes. It does remind me of doing those things. So it does kind of feed that, that lifestyle, that, that fantasy. He says he's trained 20,000 clients since starting his business, Tactical Response, in 1996. These men have each spent $450 for the two-day course, plus another $1,500 on ammunition. You can never bring too much ammo. How's business? <laughs> Booming, pun intended. In 2008, 9, and 10, I had 25% increases. 2011, I had a 50% increase. Why? People are just, in general, more afraid than they, they were 10 years ago. Afraid, afraid of what? I can't really put my finger on Like, we have couples that show up, right? And I'll walk over to them while they're loading mags, and I'll say, why are you here? They go, well, we bought these guns, and we didn't know how to use them, and we bought some food at the house, and we've got some medical supplies, because we think things are going to get bad in this country. It's a dark vision of a violent future and one promoted by the gun lobby. NRA chief Wayne LaPierre. Know that what people all over the country fear today is being abandoned by their government. If a tornado hits, if a hurricane hits, if a riot occurs, that they're going to be out there alone. And the only way they're going to protect themselves in the cold, in the dark, when they're vulnerable, is with a firearm. Those folks are often called preppers. Uh -huh. Some people call them survivalists. Some say they have a bunker mentality. Do you agree with their way of thinking? I, I guess you could call me a prepper. I have food. I have medical supplies. Like other AR-15 enthusiasts, Jaeger has more than one, though he wouldn't tell us how many. He also owns and is licensed to operate a machine gun. Why would you need the same firepower as a government? Uh, that's the surest way to ensure that there isn't a tyrannical government. Jaeger is smart, 
but he's not subtle. When he mistakenly believed President Obama planned to ban assault rifles by executive order, a majority of Americans support banning the sale of military-style assault weapons. He gave a response that was clear and concise. Fuck that. It, I'm telling you that if that happens, it's going to spark a civil war, and I'll be glad to fire the first shot. I'm not putting up with it. You shouldn't put up with it. It was a call to arms against imminent tyranny, posted to tens of thousands of subscribers on his YouTube channel. Pack a backpack with some food in it and get ready to fight. I'm not putting up with this. I am not letting my country be ruled by a dictator. I'm not letting anybody take my guns. If it goes one inch further, I'm going to start killing people. When people talk about this concept of insurrection or armed resistance, I like to ask them this question. Okay, so who exactly is it that you want to shoot? Is it your local sheriff? Is it your mayor? Is it your governor? Who is it that is the face of this oppressive government that you think you need this gun to kill? Tom Diaz used to be an NRA member. Today, he's one of the most prominent gun control advocates in the country. He says violent rhetoric like Jaeger's has a chilling effect on real dialogue. We've lost the ability to settle our differences peaceably. When you have people with assault rifles demonstrating and going into the state house, as happened recently in Oregon, forget about what it says to the government. But what does it say to you as another American who might disagree with him? Maybe you'll be a bit inhibited given the history of the United States of people shooting other people. And I need all you patriots to start thinking about what you're going to do. Within days of Yeager's rant, citing a risk of harm to the public, Tennessee suspended his permit to carry a gun, but not before he appeared a second time, touting the response to his viral video. You have no idea how many, how quickly I, I accidentally assembled an army. I assure you, uh, a, a quite formidable army. If you think that's not possible, try keying AR-15 resistance into YouTube. Thank God we have militias here in Arizona. My it's rife with conspiracy theories. Texas. And thank God they're armed to the teeth. Because they're going to need the arms that they've been stockpiling the past few years. Freelance insurrection. That there's going to be a resistance and we're going to win. And, like Jaeger, simmering with a barely contained rage. I was very angry when I made that video, and uh, I didn't have time to reflect on it before it was put up. His gun permit temporarily revoked, Jaeger tried to dial back his outburst, saying he doesn't advocate the overthrow of the government yet. It's not time for that. It is, it is not time for any type of violent action. You made a video, pretty well-watched video, that said that you would start shooting people if the president acted on his own to limit assault rifle ownership. Why? I have no comment. Do you fear that that could happen? Do you, do you fear that somebody will come for you? No, we're done. And with that, our interview was over. Our two days with Jaeger provided a window into the farther reaches of America's gun culture. Before we'd parted ways, he had spoken about freedom and the Second Amendment. What part of shall not be infringed do, does the Supreme Court and most of America not understand? It is the most clear, it is the most concise amendment that we have. And still, people tell me that it can be limited. But people would also say, I should have the right to be safe at a mall, to be safe at a movie theater, to, be, to have my children be safe at school. Mm -hmm. I believe that this utopian safe environment that people want could never exist anywhere. Even if we, if we took the weapon technology back to caveman days and we just had rocks and sticks, men are going to kill men. It's, it is in our nature. You couldn't pry that AR-15 from their cold, wet hands. For Jaeger and countless others, the demand for this tactical rifle has never been greater as the industry pushes its hottest product. What do you think that manufacturers are selling when they sell the AR-15? They're selling today's rifle. We call it the modern sporting rifle, and that's exactly what it is. Coming up, marketing America's gun to everyone and their mother. That story when we return. Put it into your hip like so. 
Load it forward, good. Take your thumb, push that lever in. We're ready to go. Depending on who you are or where you live, a young girl with an AR-15 is either no big deal or disturbing evidence of a gun culture gone too far. Pat of your finger on and press. Either way, this scene may be all you need to understand why the AR-15 has become the most popular civilian rifle in the U.S. Here we have the 22 version, which is... On ranges around the country, people like Juliana Crowder, a married mother of two, are evangelists for the gun. Perfect, right there. The AR-15 is becoming extremely popular among women. Your firearm on safe. There's not a lot of recoil, so as long as I have good stance and grip on it, I can pop off those rounds pretty fast, and it's just a lot of fun. I feel very accomplished when I can hit those long-range targets, when I can clear a malfunction, when I can do a mag reload. Ready? Fire! Let's go ahead and move to your bench, load your weapon. Make sure In 2011, Crowder started a Texas group called A Girl and a Gun Women's Shooting League now with chapters in 16 states. Their star, the AR. We have them for sporting, we have them for hunting, and we have them for just in case. Is your bolt forward? With some four million AR-15s in the hands of gun owners like Crowder, we wondered how it became so popular. So we went back to the beginning, to Prescott, Arizona, where we met a man named Jim Sullivan. Everybody said it had sex appeal. It was a modern looking gun, I mean, 50 years ago. Sullivan doesn't just admire the AR-15, he helped design it and never imagined the gun would have such wide appeal. It was designed for full automatic military use. It wasn't really designed as a sporting rifle. I don't think it ever occurred to us that it would have a very large, at least, uh, civilian uh, popularity. In the late 50s, Sullivan was working at a company called Armalite for an engineer named Eugene Stoner. Their mandate was to create a gun for the military using lightweight aircraft materials. By 1959, they had their breakthrough. It was the AR-15. AR not for assault rifle, but Armalite rifle. First prototype cost $30,000, which is peanuts in today's development. I was making $10,000 a year. <laughs> Armalite eventually sold its AR-15 rights to Colt. With fighting in Southeast Asia heating up, the government began placing orders for the gun. In 1963, it was renamed the M16. Remember, the M16A1 is a fine rifle when used in the conditions for which it was designed, such as close-in jungle fighting, it is probably the best rifle ever issued to the American soldier. The gun had a fully automatic setting, so soldiers could fire continuously as long as they held the trigger down. Semi-automatic would fire just one bullet with each trigger pull. The M16 became the iconic rifle of the Vietnam War. They found printed notes that were passed to the some of the Viet Cong said, look out for the men with the black rifle, because almost any wound was fatal. When the war ended, the M16 was the only weapon many veterans had ever known. So Colt made its first semi-automatic civilian version for that ready-made market, the AR-15 Sporter. Tom Diaz is an author who has tracked the spread of military-style weapons. How did the AR-15 become so popular with citizens? Three things happened in the mid-1980s, which is when it really took off. People began to be concerned about some kind of apocalypse, and that spawned something called the survivalist movement. Americans began to accept new technological ideas in guns, which the AR-15 embodied. And finally, there was a lot of glamour in the media that centered around military-style weapons, Miami Vice, other movies. Those potent images hit a popular nerve. An AR-15 even played Al Pacino's companion in the movie Scarface. Say hello to my little friend! Used by anti-heroes and good guys alike, the black rifle with the tactical label became a hot gun to have. It's not a case of the manufacturers pushing this platform onto the public. Quite the contrary, the manufacturers were surprised by its popularity. Steve Sinetti is the president of the Gun Industries Trade Group, the National Shooting Sports Foundation. 
He speaks for the more than 30 companies that make AR-15s, including Colt, Smith & Wesson, Bushmaster, and others. Together, they sell some 800,000 AR-15s a year, worth about $800 million in annual revenue. What do you think that manufacturers are selling when they sell the AR-15? They're selling today's rifle. We call it the modern sporting rifle, and that's exactly what it is. The SIG 556 semi-automatic rifle. But at times, the industry markets the gun with full-on military appeal, even as it insists the AR-15 is not an assault rifle. That term, they say, refers only to fully automatic military weapons. Diaz, a longtime gun control advocate and industry critic, says manufacturers are being hypocritical. Well, the marketing is relentless. It takes the military pedigree and it says you can have this too. You can be this soldier, but you don't have to enlist. But if I'm an AR-15 manufacturer, why shouldn't I advertise to my core customer just like a car maker, a clothes maker, a beer maker? They're being very rational as marketers and as businesses and as industries. The difference is what they're selling is lethality. We asked Steve Sinetti to comment on this ad by manufacturer Daniel Defense. I'll take it. How is that promoting sporting? When a lot of first time buyers go into a gun store, like you saw in the video, they ask the fellow at the counter or they try to decide for themselves what kind of gun they want. They think, what does the military use? What does law enforcement use? Either my life or my family's life is going to depend upon it, or whether or not I win a target match is going to depend on whether the gun works. Good morning, how are y'all this morning? Whatever the draw, a lot of new buyers are snapping them up. There's nothing like the threat of a ban. Well, you ordered yours just in time, didn't you? Larry Hyatt is owner of the Hyatt Gun Shop in Charlotte, North Carolina. The AR-15 now is probably the number one uh, economic engine in the gun industry. He's found the AR's transformation into a political statement is the kind of marketing money can't buy. They're buying AR-15s and ammunition. It's not advertising. It's not marketing. It's political political and financial. At his family's gun shop in McDonough, Georgia, George Mazant has seen business surge. Our sales, since AR's been going up, we've been doing about a million dollars a month in sales here at our little store. Somewhere probably 80 to 85% has been AR's and accessories. Juliana Crowder says the fact that stores can't stock it fast enough has only added to its cachet. I think there is a small bit of status for a gal that says she owns an AR-15, um, especially right now since they're so hard to get a hold of. Women make up a small percentage of AR-15 buyers, but as their ranks grow, sites like Gun Goddess are adding a twist to the market for black guns. They're painting them, they're getting these different grips and colors and stylizing it. And so the rise of this American rifle has come to this. Designed 50 years ago and used in the jungles of Vietnam, it is now commonplace and coveted. You might call it AR envy. When a girl can say, oh, I got my new baby today, or I got my new rifle, and all the girls ooh and ah over it. What are you going to name her? Oh, can you bring it next time? I want to shoot it. The AR-15 has come a long way, but it's not done yet. Just a few miles from this range, a gun rights pioneer is cooking up plans for a new AR, printed at home. All you gotta do is download it from your computer and print it in your garage. Coming up, this futurist is an anarchist. So I think you should be able to own a gun, and specifically the guns that make the government a little nervous. Presto, an AR-15 when we return. For the half century since its birth, the AR-15 has been manufactured meticulously, laboriously, in a process that harkens back to colonial times. Even today, craftsmen using traditional machining techniques carve and hammer this rifle out of aluminum and steel. Everything in this building, I think, is older than our grandparents. But what if instead of making guns like this, 
you made them like this. This is a three-dimensional printer, and emerging from that milky bath is the biggest revolution in firearm manufacture since the industrial age. Behind it all That's is nice. a 25-year-old law student named Cody Wilson. Inside this build area is a bunch of resin. We use a laser and it cures the top layer of this, uh, of this resin layer by layer until you get something that looks like this. Wilson, who lives in Austin, Texas, is the controversial leader of a movement he's dubbed Wiki Weapon. You can do everything that we're doing on open source softwares with open source platforms. Plastic gun parts built from the bottom up that actually work. Wilson is on his way towards making the first disappearing AR-15. Is your goal to design a gun specifically that can't be detectable at airport x-ray machines? I'm reaching out from a more abstract sense. I don't think guns should be observable in commerce. I don't think there should be registries of them. I don't think they can or should be monitored and observed in this traditional sense that we're becoming comfortable with. This build has He's not there yet, but the piece by piece, his goal is to perfect a do-it-yourself AR based on designs you can download from his website and create on an $800 3D printer at home. So what's the goal? The goal is to create contempt for the state. Wilson is a self-described anarchist. He envisions a society without any government oversight of guns at all. You're doing this essentially to thumb your nose mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the government. We know so much that this government doesn't want right now the AR-15 in people's hands. It hates the idea, at least in, in theory, of gun violence. It's doing everything it can to at least simulate the idea that it has it under control. We like to demonstrate that no, not only does it not have it under control, it's losing control every day. He's been named one of Wired Magazine's 15 most dangerous people in the world. Cody Wilson has placed himself in the York. eye of the gun control storm by making 30 round magazines and another key component, the lower receiver. In the normal manufacturing process, it's the only part of the AR-15 that bears a serial number and is traceable. Is your goal then to get around the federal tracing and serial number process? Of course. So you would make this, the receiver, you could make this, and everything else to build an AR-15 could be bought with widely available, relatively inexpensive commercial parts. Everything else is online, it's unserialized. Under federal law, making a gun for personal use is legal. Wilson's project could make high-capacity firepower more accessible for anyone and everyone, regardless of age or background. There is no question this helps you evade a background check. Yeah, this is, makes it easier for you to get a gun. What does the ATF think about you? I think the ATF at first didn't, didn't know what to think about me, but they recognize that we're at least trying, you know, good faith to stay on the right side of the law. I think they're one of our allies right now. Allies? Not according to the chief of the ATF's the gun tracing center, Charles is, Hauser. I think it's a serious, serious problem. Hauser's worried about the proliferation of ghost guns, AR-15 components printed out in private basements. The only necessity I can think of for building that gun is we want an untraceable gun from the get-go. We're, we're not trying to get a gun for, for some legitimate purpose, because why, why not just go to the store and buy one then? Maybe we're prohibited from having the gun, or, we'd, or we want an untraceable firearm. Why? Criminal intent. Do you advocate violence? I don't advocate violence, no. Not for violence's sake, right? But I advocate that you should be free to have that choice to use it. The jury's still out on Cody Wilson in the Pandora's box he's prying open. Is this just a modest evolution in gun manufacture or a game-changing threat to the very notion of gun control? Somebody prints out your design for this on the internet, they buy the components, they make a fully functioning AR-15, and they go on a killing spree. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Uh, it'll make me feel bad, right? But at the same time, look, just because, I, and we said it, because bad things happen, doesn't mean I lose my rights, and I'm willing to defend those rights pretty vigorously, and I'm willing to say, yeah, okay, bad things are going to happen. If Cody Wilson is right, sometime, somewhere in America, another gunman will put the AR-15 in the headlines again, because it is not only a means of recreation, of self-defense, and a potent symbol of freedom, but something more, a weapon originally designed for the fields of war. I'm Brian Sullivan. Thanks for watching.